All right, everyone. Welcome to our last um, webinar on behavioral finance. So what we're going to do here is cover reading seven, which is all about how behavioral finance fits into the investment processes. Now, this is the last reading in behavioral. It ties together a lot of things. It's also arguably the least important as it's less directly tested. Uh, that said, some of the concepts provide a useful toolkit particularly in the context of individual IPS questions where you have to identify the risk tolerance of a particular investor. So that's really the focus of this reading is what mental or what uh, frameworks exist to sort of bucket these investors based on their mental outlook and so on and so forth. So about us, uh, we're Go Study. We offer a lot of free things on our website. You can see them all, gostudy.io. We also have, of course, sort of complete uh, level three products, notes, note cards, problem sets, a custom course where we provide you feedback, etc. So go study.io. Okay, so with that said, what is reading seven and what is it about? Again, uh, least important reading, questionably at least. It's also quite short. Um, basically, we're going to introduce a number of different portfolio strategies that can lead to acceptable, if not optimal, outcomes, right? And so this is going back to this idea that individual investors are imperfect, we're subject to various biases, and some of these biases can be very hard to mitigate. Um, and so behavioral finance offers these portfolio strategies that lead to these acceptable, if not optimal, outcomes. And the end goal here is to get as close to efficient where efficient is sort of defined by modern portfolio theory and traditional finance. So to get as close to that efficient level as possible, while also designing something that the individual can both understand and stick with during market highs and lows. Um, and so we've talked a lot in reading six about how um, the key to whether or not we can accommodate an individual's quirks or whether we have to educate them out of it depends on A, the type of bias that they're facing, but also sort of on their standard of living risk. So um, the higher your standard of living risk, the lower the degree of financial risk that you're actually able to take on. Um, and then one thing to note for sure that's very important here is that um, the examples in the curriculum reading aren't necessarily great examples of how this material gets tested. What you should actually go do is skim a few IPS questions in these morning mock exams, and that'll give you a better sense of how um, these types of concepts get tested in the constructed response section, and it'll also become very clear to you what type of information is typically given in a passage where you can determine uh, individual's risk tolerance. Okay, um, so in terms of the specifics of the reading, there's really five things that get introduced two overarching strategies for investing assets, and then three specific frameworks for classifying investors. And again, the framework here, or the goal is to sort of introduce things that can help improve the advisor-client relationship. Again, this entire morning constructed response section is about portfolio management. So these goals are getting you as an advisor to understand a client, getting you as an advisor to maintain a consistent approach, having you, the advisor, really understand and act as the client expects you to act, and then just creating this mutually beneficial relationship. All right, so the first framework uh, is goal-based investing, and this is really similar to behavioral portfolio theory, which we covered earlier in reading five. And with BPT, the idea was that you build a portfolio layer by layer to meet different goals depending on your risk tolerances for those goals. So your lower risk assets are, are invested or designed to meet your key spending needs. And then as you move up this pyramid, you take greater risks to meet less essential needs. Which is to say there's an inverse relationship between your risk tolerance and your level of need. So the problem with goal-based investing is that um, each level of this pyramid is constructed or individually justified without pausing to understand how the different layers are correlated to one another. And that's why it violates sort of traditional finance and this idea that assets are fungible and um, you know you need to look at your portfolio in a holistic way and it's, it's diversification across different buckets. 
The second framework is behavioral, behaviorally modified asset allocation, excuse me, BMAA. And this is a strategy that looks to integrate as many elements of traditional portfolio theory as possible, while also sort of constructing a survey to understand where clients might deviate from that ideal, perfect, rational economic actor. So as a result, BMAA is designed to create some freedom for clients to deviate from that optimal, rational portfolio, but still striving to design an investment strategy that's as close to the efficient frontier as possible. Again, the idea being create a portfolio clients can understand and can live with through market ups and downs, and that's better than achieving a quote-unquote perfect asset allocation. Uh, just because if a client is uncomfortable and sells out at a market bottom, that can be devastating to a portfolio, right? So there's six steps here for, for BMAA. Don't expect the specific steps to be tested, but helpful to understand what it is, right? So you start with what their efficient portfolio would look like. Then you look at their financial situation and understand uh, the degree of risk that they're able to take, so their risk tolerance. We'll go over that in the next slide. That's definitely uh, basically a standard question on the morning IPS section. Uh, so you're guaranteed to need to answer individual risk tolerances of an investor. <laughs> then you look at the nature of their cognitive and emotional biases. Again, we've talked at length about how cognitive are easier to mitigate and emotional biases. If you can, uh, you often need to accommodate because they're less rational. They're um, not coachable to the same degree. <laughs> and then once you have the standard of living risk, the type of biases, the sort of background of an investor, you establish the standard deviation that's uh, allowed, um, and then you go from there. So we've seen this slide if you've been following us before. But this is all about standard of living risk, and basically what it's showing you is that the higher your wealth or the lower your standard of living risk on the y-axis, the more you as a financial advisor are able to accommodate the quirks of an individual investor. And then on the x-axis, cognitive biases, since they're easier to, to mitigate through education, you want to strive to do that where possible, whereas emotional ones are more difficult. Okay, so those are the two main frameworks introduced in Reading 7. What we're going to dive into now are the sort of three main investor classification models. Um, so for the exam, you're, you're probably going to need to be able to classify an investor according to the Barnwell 2A model, maybe the BB and K, maybe the Pompeian model, according to given information. But really, it's it's more often the case that you have to look at these passages and figure out if an investor is conservative, rational, uh, what their risk tolerance is, and so on and so forth. And so these models basically point out information that you might see in a passage and give you hints as to sort of what bucket that investor might uh, fall into. But before we actually dive into the actual classification schemes, uh, it's probably important to call out the fact that there's limits to these behavioral classifications, um, right? So an individual might not fit neatly into a bucket. They could have emotional and cognitive biases, and they are displaying them at the same time. Uh, they might be, you know, multiple different types of, of investor based on this, these models. Uh, investors change over time as well. So what, what applied to a client when they first came into your office could could well change as the near retirement, for example. Um, and then these buckets are just that, they're buckets, right? So there's a lot of variation between people within the same bucket. Um, and then I, I, this is really an important point as well. So even if you've sort of classified an investor perfectly, their behavior could be unpredictable at the most random of times. So uh, inherently these are, are simplifications of how you actually have to deal with individuals. That said, uh, for the exam, the um, uh, what, what do you call it? The sort of limitations of these models isn't tested extensively or um, really that important. So let's jump into the three models. Um, this is all conceptual material, by the way, not quantitative. Um, so the Barnwell two-way model really just divides investors into active and passive investors. 
Um, there's a couple telltale signs. So an active investor is someone who's usually risked their own capital to gain wealth, so they're entrepreneurs. Um, they've displayed historically an active role in investing their own money. They tend to be more experienced, more comfortable ris with risk, uh, particularly when they feel in control of that risk. So um, look for folks that are comfortable holding concentrated positions. Passive investors, the telltale sign here on the exam is that they've not risked their own capital to gain wealth. So uh, they could have inherited money. Um, they also could just be long-term savers who have had uh, not a risky job and have sort of saved money over time from that steady job. And in contrast to active investors, they're usually more risk averse or cautious. So Barnwell two-way model, active and passive, fairly simple. The BB and K five-way model, um, so this really just builds on some of the principles of the Barnwell classification scheme, um, but it introduces sort of two axes to classify investors. On the y-axis, you have how confident an investor is and how carefully they consider decisions and act on them is featured on the x-axis. So there's really five investor types depending on how careful or impetuous they are, how confident or anxious they are. And the straight arrow is sort of a blend of each. And the straight arrow you can think of as sort of the closest to behaving like a rational economic actor. Um, I'm not going to go through sort of the signs that are listed here on the slides, but um, definitely you should sort of spend some time memorizing the bullet points. Don't expect this to be, you know, directly tested necessarily. And then last but not least, you have the Pompeian behavioral model. So this divides investors into four different types, and those types are determined with um, behavioral interview, which is a four-step process. Uh, you're not going to need to know the steps, but basically you interview the client to determine if they're active or passive. So that's your proxy for risk tolerance. Then you plot the risk tolerance on a scale. You test them for individual behavioral biases, and then you classify into one of these four categories. And the four categories are the passive preserver, the friendly follower, the independent individualist, and the active accumulator. So they really love their alliteration here, uh, but that can be helpful. Um, so as you can see in the table, there's a lot of parallels to the BB and K model, um, and you should sort of memorize the risk tolerances, the investment styles, the dominant biases, and perhaps on the right here, um, the types of emotional biases and cognitive biases that get displayed, but you know, you won't need to see um, or get tested on that necessarily. Uh, so just to summarize, right, you have these two frameworks um, or classification investment models, and then within that, three sort of um, more detailed models for classifying investors. BB and K five-way model, Barnwell two-way behavioral model, and the Pompeian behavioral model. And really, at the end of the day, it's all about understanding the risk tolerance of investors, whether those individual quirks that they're displaying are things that can be accommodated or mitigated via standard of living risk, and being able to do that in um, terms of a lengthy passage in an IPS question that sort of talks about the history of an investor, their financial situation, uh, and some of their beliefs, usually in sort of statements that they make to a financial advisor. So that's reading seven, um, again, sort of builds on reading five and six, which compare traditional finance and behavioral finance, uh, and then go into the specific individual biases. Those two readings tend to be tested more directly. This one offers a toolkit for looking back um, through passages and sort of classifying investors as a means to decide if their risk tolerance is below average, average, or above average. So with that, um, thank you. We've covered behavioral finance here um, at length. You can find sort of the other lectures as well. Um, just go to our website, gostudy.io, tons of free material there, and a newsletter where we share everything we know about how to pass the test. Thank you.